but every memory in the past is not the real thing. It's the mind's recreation perception of the thing. Does that make sense on some level right now? And the interesting thing is, if there's positive memories that really make you feel good, then you can actually multiply and you can actually, um, what is it, like, uh, mine or you can harvest, you can actually uh, use them as resources in different areas of your life that you want to feel those ways. And if it's a negative one, less than positive, you actually can deconstruct it and actually you know, not have the problem anymore. But just like a computer, you have to get to the main level. So the mind is more, it thinks of pictures and images, and that's just how the mind works. In the spiritual world is more the emotional world, the feeling world. Physical body, I would, what I share and teach is the, the center of the body is the belly button. If you think about doing a cartwheel, if I were to do an awesome cartwheel right now, 10 out of 10 score for you guys, you probably would see my belly button move the least, my head, my hands would move the most. So this is the, the physical center of the body. We say the mind is more the psychological center of the body, even though we share the, the mind's actually in stored in the entire body. A lot of people think the mind's in the head because that's where the thoughts come through. So the thoughts come through there, so we say that's the, the center of the mind. The spiritual world, we say it's the physical, or not the physical heart, but the heart center. It's, it's the fourth chakra. It's, this is where we have a lot of immune communication, a lot of insights come through, but all the emotions come through. The financial world or the universal world is a combination of your physical health plus your mental success plus your spiritual connection equals wealth. That's just what, what we share is wealth, money is included in wealth, but wealth isn't limited to money, if that makes sense. So that being said, going back to, we have the parameters of the ego. The ego isn't there when people are born. They're just purely accessing information, all of us. And the good news is we can fully experience things when we don't have an ego. Meaning, if you guys, you know, what, what happens with babies when they get upset? What happens with babies when they can't communicate? They, what do they do? Cry. And why are they crying? Because they're having, there's a disconnection between their communication of their internal world and the external world of, of relating and communicating with people. But the advantage of not having an ego as a baby is their body fully experiences that experience. If a person or a baby or a child fully experiences an experience, there's no emotional carryover. There's no leftover. In the spiritual world, if a person doesn't fully experience an experience, we call it, it's what's called a charge, an emotional charge. And a charge, the technical definition of a charge is an unexperienced experience. Problem is, if a person goes through an experience, a painful experience, the first time their parents say no to them, they feel rejected, somebody pulls their hair, um, whatever the situation may be, they feel left out, they feel hurt. If they don't fully experience it and they shove it down, you bet your bottom dollar it's gonna come up later as a negative interest, right? You, you shove something down, I mean, name one really good psychologist, really good spiritual teacher, really good person that's uh, really connected, say just shove it, stuff it, stuff it way down and just keep it there and never deal with it. Usually you see that in comedy shows or things like that. But if you shove something down in the emotional world, it's gonna go over into the psychological world. It means your mind's gonna to try to figure it out. And if you don't deal with it there, it's gonna come into the physical world, which is dis-ease. So shoving things down doesn't work, but why do we shove things down? Where does that come from? I mean, how many people have ever, fought, when you're a little kid, you fall down to a boom, and you heard if you're a girl, people say big girls don't cry, or you know, man up or this or that, you know what I mean? A lot of people say like, you know, sh they shut down the emotion, don't let the child fully experience it. In the spiritual world, it becomes a charge where it will come up continuously to be fully experienced and processed. That's the spiritual world. In the psychological world, it becomes a part. So for example, if a person is four years old and parents, one of the parents, you know, a kid wants a, a toy and or I'll give you a simple one. Go to the, like a Target, like a Target store, and the parents just goes off for a quick second. The child for the first time in their life is like, wait a minute, this is the first time I'm crying, this is the first time I'm looking around and nobody's there for me, I can feel abandoned. And then maybe the mom was like 30 seconds or the dad was 30 seconds away, but it doesn't matter. If the child doesn't fully experience it, that abandonment's gonna keep coming through. The more I push it down, it's like a uh, credit card. It's gonna come back with more interest, negative debt. So it's gonna get bigger the more we resist it. So in the psychological world, there's parts, meaning four-year-old part of me could come up with abandonment. Like I, I coach a lot of people in the business and life coaching. Um, I'm the guy that people go to for the companies and individuals when they can't figure things out and they come to me and I do my 
thing and then I find out what's the problem and make a solution. But the majority of problems that adults have isn't the adult's problem, it's a younger part. It's something coming from the past that's not resolved. And I'm not saying this, I don't, one thing I say is I don't say spiritual concepts, I don't really believe in spiritual concepts because spiritual concepts don't produce results. Meaning I will never say something um, that I mean I believe it was something that I can actually experience or actually can break down. Meaning I'm not gonna just listen to something and say it, I'm gonna say it and I can actually say it in different ways and, and break it down. So what I mean by that is if we don't deal with things, it's gonna come back up. So the ego is meant, what's the purpose of the ego? It's meant to be an individual experience in a way. If you ask me before we're born, we're, we're fully connected. Again, this is just information, you guys can do whatever you want with it. But if you ask me, we're fully, born, uh, we're fully connected before we're born, we get to choose what we're um, gonna experience in life, we get to choose the big lessons, and we, get, we have full, full reason, and why? Why are we here on Earth, if you were to ask me, for three simple things, to learn, to grow, and to fully experience life. Beyond that, there's a little more technical life purpose where we have an individual thing. Some people came here to be music, musicians, artists, um, carpenters, some people are more empaths, some people are more business oriented. We all have our specific life's purpose and when we're on the track, when we're on the path, our body feels better, emotionally we feel better, we get a lot of different results. When we're off the track, there's some sort of dis-ease, some sort of friction, things like that. So the ego is meant to, and usually enters around the age two, three, four, five. So before that, if you were to look at a baby, look at a child, and if you were to like really notice closely or take a picture every day of a child, there's gonna be one day when the ego enters. It's just, it's a one day, one second, and their eyes change a little bit. If you look at babies, they're just an experiential beings. There's, they have depth perception, and they're starting to develop it, but you guys, you see what I'm saying, they can see into you. Or sometimes, if you think about like the, the exact opposite, going to New York, um, where there's so many people and a lot of people they just walk by and don't even you know connect to people all day. It, it can happen. I've seen it and experienced it. But with babies, they're just their world is whatever they experience. So when the ego enters, the eyes actually slightly change. Now there's a psychological stuff. There's a me. There's a mind. Instead of hurt happening, sadness happening, fully experiencing it. Then there is an ego, which another way to say it is like a container. So the ego is kind of like a container of different personalities. This is just like paintbrushes or whatever, but you can use your imagination. This is a container. It's all these different personalities. Personalities could be motivated, could be sad, could be lazy, could be funny, goofy, silly. And that's kind of what it is. Before the ego, there's different personalities. But when the ego comes, now there's it's my personality. There's more of an identity. The cool thing about the ego is there can be self-expression. The not cool thing about the ego, a lot of times it operates in it's rooted in fear and it can cause a lot of divisiveness and separation, separate from myself, from everybody else, from the resources, from that which created me. So if a person has parents who understand this or got to a certain level of consciousness or training or experience that the child falls, falls, falls down and goes boom and they let them, basically like this, I'll just give you an example. So if you can imagine there's a little child here, it falls down, starts crying, doesn't get its need met, it's crabby, needs food, needs hug, needs touch. And if I were to say like two options, number one is like, you know, just, you know, suck it up or just, you know, I don't have time to deal with this. Um, just be, please be quiet or go to your room or this or that. Just whatever it is, you can visualize shutting down. And then option number two, same scenario, but if you can imagine as the parent, would you maybe like get down on one knee or on both knees or sit down like this and we're to put one hand on the front of the heart, the heart center, and one hand on the back, the back and the heart center, and just say, all right, buddy, this is what we're gonna do. So you're actually experiencing, you know, maybe some intense emotions. What would happen if like, you just, well, we'll do this together. We're gonna go through this together. Let's relax the shoulders, let's drop them down. Let's take deep breaths. You can cry if you want, you can yell if you want, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna hold space for you and I'm actually gonna you know, touch you and this. If you, if you had an adult or child to actually help them to fully experience it, and then eventually what we learn is we do for ourselves, become habits. So you actually transfer to them, the person would be a lot more adjusted and they wouldn't attract a lot of situations in life that they don't want later. So this is more of the false self, the psychological self, and usually enters around the age of two, three, four, five, if there's more traumatic experiences, it might happen quicker. Um, 
but the ego is meant to really just to experience an individual unique way of life. A couple things about the ego, there's a couple things that fuel the ego. One of them is, to get a little scientific, carbon dioxide. If a person holds their breath, breathes shallow, tightens up a lot, but usually it's, it's shallow breathing, it actually activates more the mind and more the ego, and it, it's, it's the fuel for it. So meaning if a person holds their breath, think about a situation where um, you might have, something happened in your life, and you might have felt a little bit unresourceful. If you really look back of the most unresourceful people, and I don't care if you're talking physical, psychological, spiritual, financial, the most unresourceful people in life usually hold their breath. Energetically, they're usually contracting, and they're usually disconnecting. I was just um, doing a coaching session upstairs. We have a couple different booths, and we're giving out complimentary coaching sessions to give a deeper one-on-one -on -one experience of what I'm sharing, a little bit more of what I'm sharing. And this lady said that there was just, um, one of the big things is how most people, it's, it's, I heard it time after time, and I used to have that experience too, is she was having fear hurt come up, so to speak, and then she basically pushed God away, pushed the rest of the people away. And that's how we're conditioned in life a lot. I used to be conditioned like that. When the going gets tough, we push everything else away, and we try to do it ourselves super hard. And if you just say that out loud, that strategy, it doesn't really sound like a good strategy if you can choose any infinite possible strategies. So one of the things that I did and one of the things I teach is the harder things get, the more resourceful you get. So especially with higher consciousness, whatever you want to call it, God, infinite intelligence, the source of everything, one of those spiritual technology is to notice if you're hurt and have fear, that's the only two things that actually can push higher consciousness away. If you're pushing it away, like I'll just use the word God for example, if you're hurt or if you're feeling a lot of fear and one of the things I'll ask people, where is God, whatever you call it, I use whatever words people call it, but where is God? Is it close to you or far away? And they always say far away, and I can tell because they're suffering. And I ask them, so did they, is this, this God just saying like, oh, you have some bad juju, bad, you know, energy, like pig pen, so I'm gonna get farther away from you, or is it that you push, you know, God away? Yep, the second one, cool. So what would happen if you, while you're feeling that hurt or feeling that fear, ask God, infinite intelligence, higher consciousness, whatever you choose to decide to call it, to come in, like basically put your hand on you, touch you, come inside or surround you, what would that feel like? 100% of the time, people are like, well, that feels great. The thing with the ego, though, it's very independent. And it's part of conditioning. There's nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't feel right all the time. If a person operates independent from their heart, from their body, from the rest of humanity, from the resources in the internet, Google, YouTube is really great resources, from their higher consciousness. When people operate independent from their resources, they suffer 100% of the time for 100% of the people. That's the, literally, suffering really means resisting, and it's resisting what is it's available. And so for me, I didn't think when I was growing up that I had an ego because my definition, my mind's definition of an ego was Don Johnson from Miami Vice, and I think pretty much almost everybody knows. He didn't wear those socks, right? He didn't have socks, and he had like those white vests on, and then he was like just kind of strutting his stuff and really kind of a kind of a cocky, conceited guy from my little mental map of the world. And I remember going to India in 2006. I went to this uh, esoteric school. I was surrounded with there were swamis, there was gurus. The month before, um, Deepak Chopra was there, Oprah Winfrey, the Dalai Lama. The Pope actually, John Paul sent somebody there to, to get this place to be part of the Catholic religion. So it was a pretty big place, pretty pretty big deal. And they were talking about all this ego, and I was 26. I was among 500 people from 27 different countries, and I was one of the youngest people there. And I was just like, you know what, really authentically, is like, I don't know if I have an ego because this is what my picture is, and it's not matching up. And the guy who was a monk that was there kind of laughed and smiled, and he says, just give it about six months and I'm sure there's gonna be a phone call that we're gonna have and you're gonna call up and just be like, oh man, I'm feeling it, I'm seeing it. And he was right, he was really intuitive. About six months later, I called up and said, not only do I have an ego, it's everywhere. It's commenting on everything, it's this and that and that. I thought it was this one thing, it's not, not only is it not that one thing, it's everything else but, and how this thing called the ego is constantly commenting, constantly trying to change what was happening for me, trying to change other people, trying to change my life. Um, I heard a really good, like I was watching a good movie yesterday, a good show or something like that, 
And it's really, it was kind of really interesting thing that hit me. And the, the, the saying from the show was, um, life flows in one direction. It's wise to follow that <laughs> direction. But the ego is constantly trying to change it. No, I'm gonna control myself, my body, my universe, my family, everything. It reminds me of when I was 21, going to the ocean for the first time in my life and I tried surfing. And I was a really fit in shape guy. And just watching these little kids, watching these, you know, I think it's actually a pregnant mom, you know, taking her kid out and doing it. And I was just like, wow, like these guys are experts. And I tried, I didn't last 20 minutes. I got my butt kicked by the ocean because I went in the ocean, um, not knowing that I tried to control it. And I don't know about you, but I've, my name is Moses. So I don't know how to move the ocean like that, power it, split it. So I tried to control it. I got my butt kicked and it was a really, really humbling experience. So for me, learning a lot about the ego, first I didn't think I had it. I'm just gonna share this information with you, do what you want with it. But there's a saying that I heard in uh, religion, it wasn't my religion, I grew up in Catholic, uh, I grew up in Lutheran, but in Catholic I heard that, uh, maybe you've heard this before, but the greatest trick that the devil ever played was to convince people he's not real or doesn't exist. And I listened to that and there was some truth in that for me, but it wasn't, what, what I, how I modified it, which is really interesting was, the greatest trick that the ego ever played was there's something called the devil outside of itself to not focus on it. Meaning, this thing that's invisible, it's formless, it's not our real selves, but it, it will speak up for ourselves, it will speak up for God, it will speak up for a lot of different things. I had a lot of experience with this, and I just like, okay, but where's the opposite? Where's, where's the end to this, right? Because resisting the ego, at first I didn't think I had it, then I found it was everywhere, then I tried to change it, then I tried to kill it, then I got my butt kicked again, and it was really painful for me, and I found out the only thing I could do was to surrender to it, to accept it, yep, that's what it's doing, yep, that's, it's commenting now, yep, guilty as charged, oh, look, look, it's judging, or I'm judging somebody, yep, look, I'm judging right now. But what happened was, when I became aware of it, it started to dissolve. When I actually focused my awareness on it, the ego, the thoughts actually right before my eyes, not my physical eyes, but the mind's eye, started to dissolve. Because nobody can see thoughts with their naked eye, right? I've never met anybody. And actually, scientifically, we can't prove that we have a mind because it's not tangible, it's not physical. However, if I were to grab my phone out or for you to grab a phone out, and for those who have Facebook, and if you're gonna post something on Facebook, do you guys know what this, the, there's one little sentence, there's a little question on there? that's on there, yeah. has, anyone, has anyone ever paid attention to that? So how many people have posted something on Facebook before? Okay, so you've seen it, whether you deleted it or not, there's one question. Do you guys know what it is? What's on your mind? What's on your mind? So we all agree that we have a mind, but we can't prove it. But that's the question, what's on your mind? That's to post something, to whether you put a video or this or that. So for me, this was like hiding, trying to run the show, thinks it knows all this stuff, disconnected from the source of everything. And then I tried to, I found it, tried to kill it, and then at a certain point I'm like, well, what's the opposite of that? So there's gotta be something the opposite. Psychology talks about the ego, spirituality talks about the ego, but what's the, the opposite? And this is what I discovered, this is what I found, something called the Neo. So for like the matrix, the, the, the Neo means the one. But what does that mean? This is really, this is the one two. I'll just say, I'll just say one as, one out of whatever, billion, 7.8 billion, okay? So that's what really the ego is. I'm one out of 7.8 billion, I'm separate. But what is this thing called the Neo? It's the one, as in all that is, the one. Not separate, just all that is. So another way to say it, like the ego, if this is the false self, you could say this is the authentic self. The authentic self and if the ego is more centered in the head the knee is more centered in the heart so there's a, a story out there that I'm sure 30% uh, of you guys have heard but there's a, a grandson there's a Native American grandson talking to his Native American grandfather about and the grandfather's basically telling him a story there's these two different wolves right some of you guys have heard it some of you guys have not heard it yet but there's two different wolves one's an eagle evil wolf and one's a really good wolf and basically there's there's a battle they want to basically battle for your attention and your your energy or this or that and there can only really be one winner 
and he kind of goes on to the story for a little bit more, but basically at the end, he says, the grandson says to the grandfather, ask the question, who wins? And the grandfather wisely said, whichever one you feed. And what that means, right, that's something that's a, it's a really good story to internalize, to contemplate, to see what value it has for you. But how do you feed each one of them? This is what it's fueled by, which is oxygen, we'll get to that in a second. But the only thing that can feed or fuel the ego, really grow the ego or dissolve the ego, is your attention, your awareness. If you're focusing on, if something happens in life and you, your mind makes up a story that might not be fully true, right? How many people in this room have ever said something like, all people are like this, all women are like this, all men are like this, all bankers are like this, right? How many people, pretty much everybody said all blank is blank before? But if you were to go around and ask everyone on the planet, do you think you'd get a unanimous answer? No. It's a mental distortion, it's a generalization, right? So this, it's a false, it makes things up, it's usually a sense of separation. So this is the psychological self, you can say it is the spiritual self. And if you focus on this more, it grows. But it grows in more independence. There's a difference between independence and dependence. So if this is the container for all these personalities, this is just, it's not, this one is more of what you think you are, this, or who you think you are, this is really more actually what you are. Does that, does that make sense? If you were to, for a moment, think about who you think you are right now. Just think about who am I, just to yourself. And if you were to, if a name comes up, right, or I'm this guy, I do this job, that's really what you do, not necessarily who you are. But if you think who you are, and if you were to just temporarily dissolve that, like if you could just see in front of your in front of your eyes, like this is who I am, if you could draw, well, if I were to say, can you guys, if I could give you a pen, could anybody come up here and draw who they are? 100% capture who you are on this piece, with this piece of paper or this. Nobody would be able to because you're not limited to a word or this or that, or a picture, right? You're always more than what you think you are. So if you were to think who you are and temporarily dissolve that, and then what comes up next, what comes up next, if you were to continue that path to dissolve every thought you've had, or even just right now, thoughts can come and go, but if they were to just all dissolve, right? What's left over if you go beyond the mind? The mind is fundamentally limited by itself. But if you were to go beyond the mind, temporarily go beyond thoughts, if you can imagine your mind was as big as this room, just for, for just, just temporarily, just imagine your mind is as big as this room, and imagine what it would be like to go where your mind cannot go beyond itself. Imagine your awareness, you're sitting in this chair, you're sitting where you're sitting right now, but imagine your focus and your awareness going outside of this room, looking in on your body right now. This is like an example of going beyond the mind, beyond thoughts. If you do that, there's more of a presence, not like an identity. An identity exists within the mind. Beyond the mind is, besides an identity, is more of an experience. We'll get to questions in a second. So again, we talked about oxygen is the fuel for that. And this one is dependent. It's the opposite of independence. Depending on what? Depending on your body? Depending on the rest of the humanity, not for every single person, but you need people, right? Um, in the business world, there's sometimes people that call themselves self-made, right? And I get what they're saying, and some people don't fully understand what self-made means. But self-made, nobody in the history of, of ever, that I've ever found, that a person has done something independent from the universe and the rest of humanity. Meaning, um, if a person is self-made, like a self-made millionaire, let's say, cool, but how did you get the million dollars? Where did that come in exchange for what? So a lot of times, I ask people, do the trees pay you money? I know money you know, comes from trees, right? But do the trees pay you? No. Do the animals pay you? Do the stars pay you? Did the grass pay you? So other people gave you money, right? So what did you do in exchange for that? We can't do really anything independent from the universe itself. Does that make sense on some level? You need your body for it. You need other people for certain things. I love, this is a really nice room, but I didn't build it. It's really nice electricity, I didn't invent it. There's just a lot of things that other people that were smarter in different ways that came before me, or even at the same time, did things to help us get better. 
So the ego, it could dissolve at a certain point. The only way to do that that I found is to become aware of it, not to focus. There's two different things, and I'm gonna get a little technical, but I'll ask questions, or I have questions too. This is what focus, the mind or the ego, you can actually focus your mind on something. If you all were to focus on this black pen right now, out of infinite possible things, if you focus on this black pen, I guarantee you're not focusing on three marshmallows. I just said the first random thing that came to my head, and I, I, nobody was focused on three random marshmallows. Ready? If you focus just out of infinite possible things, just this blue marker here, you're not focusing on doing a moonwalk on the moon, right? So what I'm trying to say is that your mind can only focus on unlimited things at once, at any given moment, any given second. But focusing on this blue marker is not the same thing as being aware of something. So this is more focus, this is more awareness. And this is what I mean by awareness. You could focus on your body, right? So out of infinite possible things, you can focus on your body, but become aware of how your body feels. There's an experience when it comes to awareness, there's not necessarily experience when it comes to focus. I can prove that by giving you guys an example of in school, how many people said, you know, like, look up here, like there's a teacher, I don't know if they were a nun or something else, but like slam things, look up here, pay attention, right? They wanted you just to really look at them. They, they, they did, they did, you could have been shut down inside, okay, I'm just gonna do this to get through the, the hour and get somewhere else. But focus and attention, or focus and awareness aren't the same thing. So. The ego is something that a lot of people struggle with because they resist or they don't accept it. The lack of self-acceptance, there's, there's more suffering that I found to be true. There's this thing called the meal, which is, there's uh, the part of the whole inside of everybody. You can call it the slice of God pie. You can call it a seed of consciousness. And for those who focus on the seed of consciousness, it will start to grow. When you're focusing on this, you're not focusing on this. When you're focusing on this, you're not focusing on this. Whatever you focus on more grows. This eventually can die off. It's called, in the, in the spiritual world, in enlightenment, it's called the psychological suffering. There's, it's the, the death, it's the biggest fear the ego has is no longer existing, not mattering, right? Not necessarily dying, but if I, it's not so much dying is a problem, because I, I look at, I've seen dead bodies before, I used to be an EMT, and, I've never seen a dead body that looked like they were in pain, that looked like it's peace, or it looks peaceful. So most people aren't actually afraid of dying, they're afraid of what happens after that, not existing, the fear of the unknown. That's the biggest fear of the ego. This one is just wants attention, this is more childlike. And this is, the more you focus on it, the relationships start to change. Meaning, this is one of the most important things I'll write. This is more self-centered. And this is more selfish. Completely different things in my way. If a person operates more from a self-centered point of view, it means, if, if I were going to model self-centeredness, it means um, I'm hungry now, or I'm, I'm crabby, or somebody's making noise, hey, everyone shut up. I'm not really saying this, but I'm giving an example. Everyone shut up because I don't want, I don't want you guys to make noise because I, I would feel comfortable. Self-centered is basically, I'm the center of it and screw everybody else, right? I'm not connected to everything. That's what I mean by self-centered is, it's, it's me, like I'm first and everyone else can be last or whatever. Selfish is a little bit different. Selfish is, there is a self, I'm a person too and my, I need to get my needs met, right? I'm, I'm self-centered, there's not an awareness of other people's selves. Selfish is, I gotta kinda get my needs met first, not in every situation, because I can have an abundance or I can have a, you know, I can share more than I have. But that's why we wanna get overflowing. But selfish is more of, I'm a person too, I need to get my needs met, especially in relationships. People that operate from more self-centered, there's just a lot of fighting and there's just me, 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 right? There can only be, it's like the Highlander, there can only be one, you know, like especially with big families. I know my wife grew up in a family of seven kids and her mom had 12, uh, uncles and aunts, my dad had 12 uncles and aunts, and there was a lot of fighting for attention and a lot of different things, like the Highlander, right? So there can only be one, but if it's more of selfish, it's taking the time, investing the time in yourself, knowing that you're a person too, but somebody else is a person as well. So I am gonna probably limit this to about like 40 minutes or so, and kind of talked a little bit about the difference between the ego and kind of what it does, the purpose of it, 
it's a natural kind of rite of passage to be experienced as an individual, but if it's an individual that's disconnected from other people or only my um, opinion matters, nobody else, obviously you can see that's a really good strategy for some sort of confrontation in life. This thing called the Neo, which is, this is more of the thoughts and this is more of the feelings. Um, my counterpart, my wife, uh, Amanda, she's gonna, be, she's gonna be talking tomorrow doing a seminar on the difference between thoughts and feelings. It's gonna take a, a whole other different side to this. And a lot of times thoughts are really, really, really important, but sometimes people overthink, right? And what I share is there are no emotions in here, and there's no thoughts in here. But sometimes people, and I used to not be able to understand that or see that because I didn't experience it, but after enough time of investing in inner awareness, so to speak, I saw there was a difference between my thoughts and feelings would fire at the same time, but the more I became aware of the thoughts, there was more and more space between the thoughts and feelings, which gave me more control over my thoughts and our reactions and behaviors, right? We can't control the mind, but there's different things we can do. So this Neo is born inside of, it's built inside of everybody, and it won't grow or get developed unless it gets nurtured. I'll even go one step further. Sometimes people do self-deprecating or self-hatred, and this is what they're talking about. So when someone says, I hate myself, the self is extremely sensitive, and a lot of times it will, it will go and hide because it doesn't feel safe. Sometimes people's meals don't even feel safe around themselves because think about if I had a kid, and every time it came, I threw something at them, I didn't give them fat, I'd say, go to the dungeon or this or that. The kid probably wouldn't want to come over anymore. The same thing is kind of like the Neo. It's very sensitive, it's very childlike, and it needs to be nurtured. If you shut it down, it won't come out. But if you can say, you know, what do you want to do? It's like, what do you, what do you want to do? Like, for example, if some of you guys committed to going to another seminar, but then you really just like, hey, but I want to eat, then you should probably do what you feel called to do, go eat. If you guys think like, oh, my dad did this for a job and I have to do this, you might want to check in with yourself. What do you want, right? What do you want? What would feel best for you? And ultimately, be an advocate for yourself. Yourself needs to get nurtured. You're, this is something with empaths too. A lot of times, people like myself and empaths, we disproportionately help people, right? And the problem with empaths is we forget without the awareness that we're a person too. It works best, human beings work best. Think about it even financially, right? The more you have, the more you have to give. But if you give somebody all you got and you got nothing, that's not the most intelligent thing on a very continuous basis. So let's open it up to, we'll take about five minutes or so for any questions that you guys have. You want me to say things differently? You want me to expound on something more or a personal question? Or it's just a lot of information. You gotta like, like kind of breathe for, for a few seconds, let it absorb. What's the best thing to do to grow the The best thing to do, the question is what's the best thing to do to grow the Neo? You really can't do it without addressing this. But the simple answer is listen to yourself, but not here. Because sometimes, oh, I think this would be best, but I know this would be best. This is more logic, this is more intuition. So it's listening to the intuition more, but the more a person fights the Neo, like stop it, I can't do this, I'm not gonna have those negative thoughts, blah, 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 it just, I found it gets worse. But if you can just watch negative thoughts and welcome them, for example, I shared with you guys, if somebody comes in this room, and I, I, if I'm worried at all, just, just take off, or if your butt hurts, or if you gotta get, you know, eat, go ahead and take off. It's just, it's total freedom. So ultimately the ego needs total freedom to really allow it and express itself, and then it, it dissolves, it serves its purpose. So, but listening to yourself, developing your intuition, uh, a lot of times people don't know how to do that, so one of the things that you could do, one of the best takeaways for today, would be to put one or two hands on the center of your chest like this, and then ask yourself and focus your awareness about three inches behind your hands and check in with yourself and like, what do I want? What do I need? This is more here. Somebody can, I ask sometimes people questions, what do you want? And they're like, well, I think it'd be best to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you answered from your head what you, th what you thought, but that wasn't the question I asked and it wasn't the right location that I asked from. So to put your hands like this, um, and f just really, the more you can focus on the center of your chest, this will dissolve. But it's not gonna be the most comfortable. Uncomfortability precedes growth. 
if a person really wants to dissolve this and nurture this, there's going to be some things that this didn't fully experience, some, some damage, some hurt, some trauma, some pains are going to come up, and some of it needs to be nurtured. For example, if you were somebody in my life really dear to me and you were sad, I wouldn't shut you down and be like, shut up, get out of here. I'd be like, what do you need right now? And so, ideally, to treat this relationship, pick your best relationship in life. Is it you? Is it your dog? Is it a spouse? Is it your best friend and your kid? Uh, is it your sweet, sweet shoes, sweet boots? You have an awesome collection. Whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. Treat your best relationship. Treat yourself like you treat your best relationship. But most people, they don't get a lot of time for themselves. In a 24-hour period, most people, they don't dedicate a lot of time for themselves, consciously. It's not just like enough to buy a gift for, yeah, I bought this because I should, you know. Shooting on somebody is from the ego. You know, this is, it gets messy. You shouldn't really shit on people. But, but this one would be to focus on yourself, relax, breathe, check in with yourself as much as possible. Not just during church, not just during yoga, not just during ohms, the space in between. As much as possible, the more repetition and awareness, and it's a process. But the lot, it's, it's not, this is the um, simpler, but not easier process. It's more common for people to operate like this. No, you pass the blame, and all the energy and information goes outside. It takes a really strong person. I mean, the difference is like a spiritual warrior besides a spiritual seeker. A spiritual seeker might be like, give me this new crystal, okay, cool, give me this new drink, cool, give me this new essential oil, cool, give me this new blah, 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 let me go to this place. You know, Sedona's got it, Brazil's got it. So the answer is somewhere outside of myself. Where a spiritual warrior is like, you know what? I am searching for a solution for my suffering and I'm willing to do whatever it takes, including being with myself and serving myself and asking myself, what do you need and doing my best to go in. Nobody has all the answers. Nobody can do it by yourself. You are not built or born or designed to do it by yourself. So it's not impossible. So just give up, do, quit doing it by yourself. Just give up on that. You're gonna give up on anything. And then just say, where can I get help from? Your unconscious mind, which is the most intelligent part of the mind, higher consciousness, Google, YouTube, the two most valuable resources <coughs> on the internet, if you ask me. Um, research, find out somebody else, who else is successful in this area of life, maybe they can help me. Books, there's free audio books, there's, there's a lot. But the, it's about focus, but you have to address this, ultimately you have to nurture it. And sometimes this can be pretty nasty, less than lame. And then what's your strategy for that? Nope, get rid of it, okay? But be calculated by it, if you try to get rid of it and push it, does it work? Does it permanently work? If it doesn't, you might wanna turn and face it and say, what do you need? And really, really wants attention. But when you give it attention, it starts to dissolve. Does that make sense? Okay, anything else? Yes, sir. When you astral travel, is that more of an image or something that you're seeing in your eyes? I'm gonna answer it a couple different ways. So, in the psychological world, the mind sees things as images. Technically, we call them internal representations, meaning pictures and movies, in the psychological world. In the spiritual world, they're called insights. The difference between an image of the mind and an insight, you can see it in the same way in, in, in third eye, or you can experience travel outside your body, this and that. The technical difference is if it's created by the mind, you can change it. You can make it two-dimensional, three-dimensional. You can change it from color to black and white. If it's moving, you can change it to still. If it's here, you can move it there. If it's an insight, you can't change it at all. There's nothing you can do to change it. You can try, and it just doesn't work. It Pretty much you don't want to try and it feels really good and connected and really pure so that's that's one thing that's the difference between an image and an uh, insight but as far as if you're going in your body somewhere else or out of your body those are two different things too um, some people can fake it through their mind and just say yep I'm feeling this and really want it so bad and faking it but that's not that that's really through the mind so to speak but if you do it beyond the mind and it's a happening and there's nothing you can do really to stop it then it's more of a insight and that can be beyond the mind does that make sense and in the dream world it seems many times much more like the real life world for some and people, i realize yeah. that's an image but why does it not seem like an image it's more like you're there it's more like an experience yeah and that's the difference is, again, a little more technical, an image could be, I see this image, which is more in the psychological world. Spiritual world or experiential world, I'm in it, I'm inside of it. Instead of I see myself, 
I'm looking through my own eyes. Does that make sense? Associated or dissociated. Someone can be like, okay, I'm going to a place and I can see myself frolicking with the fairies on horseback and unicorns and rainbows. Or I'm on the rainbow. Or I'm on the unicorn. I'm kind of making a little just an example of things. But the difference between if you're in it or you're looking through your own eyes, like all of you guys are looking through your own eyes right now. If you were to take a picture of yourself and look at that picture, you can see yourself looking at something. That's the big difference. Okay, one more. All right. So the biggest takeaway I would say for today is there is this thing that's invisible. It doesn't really want to be seen because if you can see it, then it starts to dissolve and it no longer exists and it, it just it wants to exist. It's really rooted in fear. A lot of people do things or don't do things because they're afraid of things. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. This is the insight, this is the more intuition that connects, that's like, do it, have the experience. For example, everything that's ever happened to everyone in life, if you ask me, everything that's ever happened to you was meant to happen. How do we know? Because it happened. So simple, you don't even have to argue or think about it. This might try to change it. I might try to change the past, try to change the future. No problem, I'm a very technical technician person. How does that feel? Doesn't feel very good. <coughs> cool, what would feel better? What if you would just let it go, cut the cord from it? Oh yeah, that would feel great, cool, let's do that. And keep doing it in another area of life. So, this you need to become aware of what the mind is thinking, but if you're holding your breath, the mind is gonna be in control. The mind is gonna be so active, because carbon dioxide, the less oxygen is in your body. I mean, think about it. Try not to work out. Try to only breathe, like put a girdle on, right? Put a girdle on, super tight. Try, don't work out, don't move very much, and what kind of quality of life is there going to be? You, you already know the answer. The body's meant to move. We have to meet, meet an allowance. Go to an oxygen bar, go to a yoga class, go to a deep breathing exercise, go to a salt cave, right? How do you feel afterwards? It's so great. Awesome. Go out, do some cardio that doesn't hurt your knees. Go for a bike ride. So get some more oxygen in your system. Put your hands on your heart more. Literally, this is an anchor, this is technology. A lot of times people they might think about it, oh yeah, but if you actually touch, this is putting your physical body with your mind and your higher consciousness all synced up, all lined up. It doesn't matter if it's one finger, two, hand, this. You get someone else to touch you too, yep, put your hand on me. One in front and back, the more the better sometimes. But focus on this and it will start to grow. And be really open to the feedback, be really open to there's things that are unresolved in the past that you really fundamentally can't do by yourself. I'm not saying this to put a negative frame around you, I'm just saying as human beings we need each other, we need help. But a lot of times the independence is, okay, I need help, I'm gonna go to the first person closest to me that's not an expert in the field that you want help in. Does that make sense? I'm gonna ask my mom, what does your mom do? Uh, she's just gonna, she loves me, I'm gonna do her best. That might not be good enough or technical enough. So go outside your comfort zone, do something different. If you want different results, do something different than you've done before and get the connection and the results that you want. So my name is Jeremiah Rangel. I'll be upstairs um, doing one-on-one -on -one coaching and answering more questions. And I wanna say thank you guys very much for coming. Sure.